like to call the meeting to order. May I remind everyone to uh, turn off your cell phones so we have no disruptions. I appreciate it. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Paul? Here. Vice Mayor Lewis? Here. Councilmember Whitman? Here. Councilmember Hatton? Here. Councilmember Starkey? Here. Mr. Lamack? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Holstey? Here. Mr. Weinthal? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Mr. Weinthal is here by phone, correct? Okay, the first thing on the agenda for the first of the month is the public comments. We devote this time to anyone who would like to come up and speak on any topic they wish, except for anything that might be on uh, the public hearing portion of the agenda. Each, each speaker will be allowed three minutes. And... Um, is there anyone here that wishes to speak? You can come forward at this time. Come ahead. State your name and address, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alejandro, and my address is 9450 Point Siena Place. Um, I wanted to come here to bring some attention to our community's lack of sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, Specifically, we, we have two four-lane collector roads, um, Pine Ridge Drive and Orange Grove Drive. And neither of these have crosswalks or sidewalks consistently along uh, both sides of each road. Um, I think it's a safety issue for everybody, obviously. Um, but I, I think children are affected the most by this. Um, there are several school bus stops throughout these roads. and. When these kids are dropped off, um, they're, they're dropped off right onto the grass. So I see this every day. Um, these kids have to walk through the grass and alongside the road. Sometimes they just walk on the road. Um, so that's pretty concerning. Um, it's also concerning because the posted speed limit on these roads is 30 miles an hour. And the actual road design is closer to 40 miles an hour. So, and I think that's re why uh, recently the Davie Police Department has placed a speed feedback sign on Orange Grove um, because wider lanes tend to make drivers uh, speed. So I think this is dangerous for our most vulnerable in our community. And I think sidewalks and, uh, well, building them and maybe even redesigning uh, our roads uh, would be a good idea. It would promote health, active lifestyles, safety, community, and it would also reduce car trips to the nearby Pine Island Plaza. And I hope you'll consider uh, what Thank I have to Thank you say. very much. Thank you. Um, we've received a number of emails uh, about this subject, and uh, it gets a little more complicated than you might think. You just can't just put in a sidewalk. Um, you can either speak with uh, Mr. Lamack or with our engineer, and they can uh, give you some ideas of what can be done. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearings and we'll move on to our agenda. Our first is a uh, presentation, a recap of the uh, our legislative Days in Tallahassee, a continuation of last week's presentation. And we have uh, Representative Bartleman, Representative Hillary Gassell, and uh, our consultants, uh, Lauren and Candace from Eric's Consulting, are here. So um, you decide which one wants to go first and how you want to. Come on, Hillary, you start. Thank you. I, I have the honor of going first. I have to drive to Orlando as soon as, uh, as soon as my presentation's over for a conference, so I appreciate both of you allowing me the opportunity 
Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members, for allowing me the opportunity to present to you a legislative update. My name is Hillary Cassell. I have the honor and privilege of representing District 101, which, as you know, encompasses portions of Davie, as well as Dania Beach, Hollywood, Hallandale, and South Fort Lauderdale. This is my first year of my first term. I am a freshman legislator. And what a year, right? What a year to be able to have the opportunity to represent the constituents of Broward County and District 101 in Tallahassee and be there voice. I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you guys a little bit about my experience and my successes in Tallahassee as a first year, uh, first term legislature, legislator. So I actually am a property insurance expert. I am an attorney. I've been practicing law for 18 years and for the last 14 years I have solely focused and specialized in that area. Prior to running for office, I was a consumer advocate engaged in the legislative process, going to Tallahassee um, to educate legislators on the problems that we face in our property insurance in our property insurance market, which sadly we still face because the reforms that were passed really were just a wish list for the insurance industry and rather um, did not provide any consumer protections, nor did it provide any rate relief. I can talk to you a little bit more about that at the end of my presentation, but um, that was what really prompted me to run. I think we need somebody that understands property insurance. We need been in a crisis since 1993. This isn't our first rodeo. Um, and we really need to get a handle on it so consumers and Floridians can have some stability and uh, predictability with regards to their insurance rates. But despite the fact that my professional experience is as an attorney, I thought it was best to request to be placed in a silo in the house um, that I thought was going to be the most beneficial to my district. So I could have asked to be placed in judiciary or in banking and insurance, but I wanted to be placed in the infrastructure silo. And contained within the, within the infrastructure silo were committees um, dealing with our agriculture and natural resources, our water management, primarily focusing on our scarcity issues, our availability issues, our contamination issues and turning Florida and, and getting us off septic uh, throughout the state of Florida. As we know, that's really primarily where our contamination issues come from. I also was able to, by asking to be placed in the infrastructure silo, I was placed on a special committee related to hurricane resiliency. Being a hurricane attorney, I know firsthand how important um, resiliency and uh, being proactive, um, how important that is to protect our cities and our homes. Um, but that was a great opportunity for me to hear from various cities and municipalities and counties throughout the state that were impacted by Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole to find out what worked, what didn't, and how can we bring that back to our district to make sure that we're ready, not when the next, not if the next storm hits, but when it hits. Um, I also had the honor of being in the infrastructure, the main infrastructure committee. Um, and the agricultural and natural resources, which I think is um, important to Davie in particular, because we talked a lot about our farmers, how important farming is in Florida. I actually am the granddaughter of a tomato farmer. Our farm was based in Delray. Uh, I grew up on a farm, so farming is not only important to me personally, but I also know how important it is to not only the economy in Florida, but you know, in particular to Davie, um, which is obviously uh, important to me because I have the honor of representing you guys. So. It was a really um, eye-opening experience. This is the first time that an infrastructure committee has ever been created. It is a vision of Speaker Renner's. So to have been appointed to that committee, I just felt that that was going to give me the best opportunity to be able to help my district in the most uh, possible way, even though, again, like I said, it's not necessarily my uh, professional experience. One of the things that I always like to talk about, because I think it's something that we don't see often, is you know, we know that this legislative session was a pretty divisive legislative session on issues. But what I always like to highlight is what did we do together? 81.5% of the legislation that's passed in Tallahassee passed with full bipartisan support. What does that mean? That means less than five members voted in opposition to a bill while everybody else voted in support. So while we hear primarily about the issues that really divide us, I like to focus on the ones that bring us together and that 81.5% because it's important for the people to know back at home that we are able to work across the aisle if you're willing to. And there's a, an article, there's a, a news outlet called Florida Politics that does an, uh, winners and losers of the you know roundup at the end of the legislative session. And 
and I was specifically um, mentioned for my ability to build deep relationships across the aisle. And why do I mention that? I think it's important for you as the council to know that your representative, while maybe being in a party that's in the super minority, I am still able to accomplish things and I'm able to still get things done by working across the aisle, making myself available to make policy better because at the end of the day, that's what matter. I didn't go there to represent a political party. I went there to represent the people. So to have an organization like Florida Politics specifically state that I am somebody that has been able to fortify deep relationships across the aisle, also while calling me a thoughtful bomb thrower from the back row, um, which that just goes to show my passion and my advocacy for the issues that I do need to fight for. One of the things that I'm most proud of um, is I was able to pass a law called, called Grayson's Law. Many of you are probably familiar with a young boy here um, living in plantation by the name of Grayson Kessler, who was sadly killed in a murder-suicide by his father. And this was a situation where the mother did everything right. Allie petitioned the court, had over 250 pages of evidence of showing escalation of threats and intimidation from the father of her child directed directly to Allie. Um, the law, unfortunately, had loopholes and did not allow the court to protect Grayson because the threats were not directed to him. They were directed to Allie. Grayson's law changes that. And we do know that is really going to bring the family law section of the, of the court system up to date. Um, and more modern with the things that parents are facing today and modernizing what judges are able to look at when evaluating really difficult situations such as shared parental responsibility and time sharing. Um, so Grayson's law has been signed by the governor, I'm happy to report, um, and that is a bill that, that is a law that will go a very long way to protect Florida's families, and I am very proud of that. From an appropriation standpoint, we passed the biggest budget. We're still waiting on the governor's signature, but passed the biggest budget in state history, $116 billion. I am proud to say that I brought back $6.8 million, assuming the governor does not veto any of my projects. I will have successfully brought back $6.8 million back um, to our community. So I am so honored to represent Davey and to have had the opportunity to meet all of you along the way throughout the process. I look forward to continuing and building a strong relationship. You have an amazing team in Tallahassee. I always say my mind is always on the people back at home. So it's always great to be able to connect when you're up there with the people that know what back home means and provide that guidance. And your consulting team does exactly just that. I always felt I knew where you guys stood, where Davey stood on issues. Um, you are well represented, as especially, again, also with Representative Bartleman. So thank you for the opportunity to present before you. And if I don't know if we're taking questions or if we're passing it along. Thank you very much. She is amazing. She did a great job as her in her freshman year, so I'm very honored to serve with Hillary. Thank you very much. I'm Robin Bartleman. I am your state representative for District 103. I was just thinking how lucky you are that you have so many people behind you. You have Michael Gottlieb, you have Lauren Buck, you have Hillary Cassell, and you and, and I and me as well. And for the people who are watching, I represent west of 75 that portion of Ivanhoe. And I've knocked on their doors multiple cycles and I've got to meet everyone, they're wonderful. But for many years, I served as your school board member. I, I first wanna let the people of Davie know how lucky they are to have this town council and the mayor and what an amazing job they do and how they really advocate before each session. We talk about issues that are pertinent to Davie. We talk about League of City issues and they keep us well informed and uh, city manager, uh, Lamac just met with me about a bill the other day that I had a question about and we're working on now. So you have great staff and I serve on state affairs. So I get all of the bills that destroy your local control. And I can't say enough about LJ and Candace Eriks because they are literally a text away from me because I get a bill and I go, well, this doesn't sound good. What is this going to do? And I know LJ is going to go over all the powers that have been taken away from you shortly but it's, it's, they work hard and they fight and we file amendments to make them better. So I, I am in the healthcare silo, uh, former teachers, uh, the mayor and uh, Carol Hatton. I was in education, fought too hard. They took me out this time. <laughs> what a surprise. God forbid you have someone who understands the FEFP. But healthcare was a perfect silo for me this session because I've been focusing on a bill 
for the last three years, and I'm very proud to say that it passed this session, a bipartisan bill, and it has to do with kid care. For people who do not know, um, kid care is an insurance, insurance for people who don't qualify for Medicaid but are 200 percent below the poverty level. So these are our working families. And I became familiar with kid care when I worked in the school system and I knew we had paraprofessionals and cafeteria workers and custodians who could not afford the dependent coverage at the school system because it, was, it would take their whole paycheck. And so, and then they made too much to qualify to get the kid care. Because if you qualify for kid care, you get health insurance for all your children, $20 a month, and that's for vision, dental, and mental health and physical needs. So what, it, what uh, people just, they, they, they had to make hard decisions. Do I take a raise where I could get knocked off of kid care? If I make 50 cents more an hour, I'm going to get knocked off. And when you get knocked off, your dependent coverage goes from $20 a month to $259 per child, which is an 1,100% increase. So there are people who will refuse to prosper in their job. They'll say, I can't do it. I have a child with diabetes. I, I need to have the coverage. Uh, I also had a family member who's like, I work every day. I go to work. I work two jobs, and I can't afford this. Why doesn't anyone help me? So this has been a passion of mine. I've been working on it before I was a state representative, and this year it passed, and I, it's my legacy. I'm waiting for the governor to sign it, thanks to Speaker Renner. Uh, Alexis Cataloo, the senator, carried it again for me in the uh, Senate. I had Representative P Senator Perry last year. And so what it does is it changes the threshold to 300%. And so what that means is that there's now an opportunity for families to access coverage, and it creates additional tiers. And these are your working families in Davie who are going to take advantage of this. It goes into effect in January once it's signed. As you make more money, you will pay more money for your kid care coverage. But what happens is, is when you get to the end of the coverage line, when you're about to fall off that cliff, you're going to be prepared to assume the responsibility of the full pay program because we have built you up to that. And that's addressing a very huge fiscal cliff that exists for working families. So that, to me, I always said, before I die, the only thing I want to do is kid care. And I'm so happy because... It's going to help so many people. Um, another bill, all of my bills come from uh, people. A lot of the ideas come from people or situations that are in the community. And there were actually Davie residents at this meeting. So I met with a group of parents with students with disabilities, with developmental disabilities. And out of that meeting, we came up with an idea because what happens is if you have a child with a disability, you have full-time ESE pre-K. But your kids sometimes, if they have a developmental disability, by definition, they're behind. They're, they didn't walk or crawl at the same rate. They don't have the same communication skills, fine motor skills. And a lot of parents go, well, I would really like to have an opportunity to have them have an extra year in pre-K because they are not ready to go to kindergarten. They may not be toilet trained. They may not have the prerequisite skills. But you don't want to do that because if your child is in, depending on their disability, they're going to get retained again before the third grade if they don't pass the reading test. So there's a danger because they don't have a good cause exemption, even though the best decision would be to retain them in pre-K. So now we change the pupil progression plan, and the parent, it's a parent choice, along with the IEP team, can say, look, my kid's not ready for kindergarten. I don't want them on that bullet train with everything. I need to make sure that they have a strong foundation before they go in, and they don't have to worry about the repercussions. So that actually came out of from parents, the mouths of parents, and I got to meet their children. Uh, this is very important for you as well. Another bill uh, regards to unlawful dumping. Who knew that in our special Broward drainage districts and special districts, there's like not trespassing rules or arrests for unlawful dumping. So I, along with uh, Representative Altman, passed that. That has been signed by the governor. And then the, the silliest situation I've ever heard of came before me, like I had a friend who's a teacher and she retired and you'll appreciate this, Carol and the mayor. They're like, all I wanna do is volunteer in my kids' class, my grandkids' classroom. That's all I want. I wanna be the room mom. I don't wanna be the teacher, I'm retired. I wanna go on the field trips and do all the fun stuff. They can't do that currently because they risk losing their pension 
if they're in the FRS system. So I was like, are you kidding me? This is the silliest thing I've ever heard. And for police officers as well, a lot of times when they retire, if they're in the canine program, they want to come back and keep working with the dogs or they want to do the reserve unit. And they can't do any of that the first year of retirement or they risk losing their pension. So I'm proud to say that it passed both houses unanimously, that it requires FRS employers now to create a volunteer system so that people can actually retire. These are people with community service in their heart. Look, you have two retired teachers on this dais right here, right? It's in your heart. This is what you do. And to just sit home and not be able to be a guardian ad litem or volunteer at a school or read at a library is ridiculous. So that also got fixed. Uh, in terms of appropriations, uh, the South Broward Drainage District, which impacts part of your city, that has been a labor of love. I know all, where all the pumps are. I, uh, I know how it goes through the C-11 canal. You know, I've been working on this multiple years. We've gotten multiple appropriations. And you should know that the mobile stormwater pumps are here. So if you have an emergency where you need immediate drainage, these pumps are, like, huge. They're, I don't even, they wouldn't fit in this room, but they're huge. They will come out and pump the water. And I know your city manager knows how to get in touch with Kevin Hart. But I was able to get an appropriation that is not very sexy. It had to do with culverts. So when I went to every chair, everyone's got these great appropriations, like for this group home, and I'm like, I need culverts. And first of all, I wasn't really sure what a culvert was, but these culverts are so big, there you, you can put a semi-truck to run through them. And you have to have these culverts so the water can drain out through the C-11, out to the East Coast, or else you're gonna have inland flooding where we live, and we already have issues with that, and we know that. So we were able to get the funding for those culverts, which not the most exciting one, but it's great to have, and in the long run, that's gonna protect our property, so it's very important. Drainage improvement districts, you border south, your part of your city borders Southwest Ranches. We know right on Dykes Road, there's drainage issues, so everything's interconnected. So I was able to get another drainage, this is my fourth drainage project in uh, Southwest Ranches. And then for those of you who are veterans out there, there's something called the Dellenbach Foundation. And they, many of you know Jeff Dellenbach, former Dolphin player, and he helps veterans in need and children are in need. And usually they come in when they don't have, other charities don't have enough resources. So we're able to help them with their vet program, get an appropriation for them, and an appropriation for music society. Because nobody thinks about this, but if your kid is in a band, you have to rent an instrument, you have to get the uniforms, you have to pay for the trips. That's why they're always selling candy bars. But sometimes parents have to come out of their pockets to do that. And so they actually have a program where they help parents. And so I was very excited about that. Um, in terms of insurance, um, I know everyone's hurting out there. Uh, most of us did not vote for the property insurance bill because it did not have any protections for the consumer, nor did it help the, help the consumer. We had a bill that our uh, delegation presented that would have frozen some costs on insurance, would have had an elected insurance commissioner, which makes sense because none of us would have reelected the insurance commissioner because none of us can afford to live in our homes anymore. Uh, one thing that I need to make people aware of is that I, my last call on this topic was actually here in Davie. Um, so if you cannot get any insurance and you have to go to Citizens, if you're at the replacement cost on your house, not the cost of your house, how much it costs to replace, if it costs more than $700,000 and construction costs have gone up over 35%, we're not talking mansions here. They do not have to cover you. So a resident just sold their house here because they could not afford their insurance. So they could not get citizens, so you have to get the bank insurance, and that bank insurance was going to cost them $30,000 a year. So they had to walk away from their dream. So for the last three years, I have been fighting to change the threshold. Why should we change the threshold? Because if you live in Miami-Dade County, your threshold is a million dollars. Why are they treated differently? Why is Monroe treated differently? So I've been working on this multiple years. I brought forward a bill. We got a study done. Uh, there's a lot of resistance. I did have one person who was really, this year, I was smart. I didn't want to put it in a bill because if your bill isn't heard, you can't amend it. So I was going to everyone I could think of, can you please amend this onto your bill, please? So I'm getting some traction, so hopefully next year, because Broward County is really impacted, and it's very scary. If anyone out there is having issues with their insurance or needs help or needs to get to the Office of Insurance Regulation, you can contact me, Robin Bartleman. Um, we try to help everyone. It's, I get phone calls all the day, senior citizens, 
that are going without any insurance because they own their home, but they can't afford the insurance. So it's breaking my heart what's going on for peop with people. So make sure you call me. My cell phone number is 954-668-3662. I'll say it again, 954-668-3662. You'll actually get me on the phone, and I'm going to let them cover all the rest. There are a lot of really crazy, terrible bills, and I will continue to fight and be a champion for public education and for families. And uh, I think w between having Hillary there and our, uh, our leader, Drisc uh, Representative Driscoll, that we're going to find a way to help people with insurance because we can't sustain this anymore. We can no longer sustain this. So I appreciate everything. I'm going to leave it up to your experts here to cover all the rest. I love all of you. Thank you for always being there for me. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and effort. Candace and Lauren, did you? Now these are two of the hardest working people. And the reports that you send us each week, or, or Lauren especially, uh, uh, are so thorough and so invaluable. They're, uh, they're very helpful and appreciated. Mayor, we thank, we thank you very much and the council um, and to your Could staff. Could you speak into the mic, yes. please? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to the council. Also, um, to your staff, they're amazing. Leona, Phil, uh, town manager, we can't, you know, yourself, we 100% we can't do this job without the input and the quick responses that we get all through session and during committee weeks. So we greatly appreciate it. I will not take any of the credit for the reports. Lauren is amazing, and she knows this, uh, every bill that comes out, every amendment that comes out, she sends that and get quick responses, but I want to make sure that you know how appreciative we are of the relationship. We love the town. We love working with you. And, uh, you know, our work is um, right around the corner. We start early this year. We go back um, up to Tallahassee in September. We have committee weeks in September, October, November, December, and start legislative um, session uh, formally in January. But I want to thank all of you who come up for Broward Days and for the League of Cities Days. It's important. The advocacy is important. The help is important. And the presence is important. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to go over the good and the bad. And always know that we are a phone call, text, or anything away. But we greatly appreciate it. We're very happy to be home. Thank you. Um, so first off, I, I want to also give kudos to Representative Bartleman. Um, she is absolutely fantastic. Everything that she was saying, especially about the kid care, I don't think that she can talk enough about that because it really was a tremendous accomplishment that a lot of people have been wanting for years. So to have a member of the Broward delegation be able to pass that was, was absolutely wonderful. Um, so we want to thank you for your leadership. Um, so. There was the biggest budget pass, as Representative Cassell mentioned, $117 billion. That did include $200,000 for our, our mobile classroom uh, for fire safety, and it also included $125,000 for the hardening of the public safety facility. Um, the governor hasn't yet to sign the budget. We are expecting a sizable veto. That's what we've heard. As you guys know, the veto process is very political, and this year it might be even more political than it ever has been. Um, so it's it's a little bit hard to predict right now. We, we thought the budget would have been signed by now we're still we're still waiting on that to happen um, but we met with OPB which is the Office of Policy and Budget very early on even before our, our projects were in the budget and we followed up with them again um, so we've been in, in conversations constant conversations with the governor's office and our hope is that those those projects make it through unfortunately we can't celebrate until the budget is signed however um, and, and with that it's about um, the, the governor's recommendations were 114 billion. So it was about three billion over the governor, governor's recommendations. However, they did find additional revenue that came in over projections, I think something of the tune of like $5 billion. Um, so whether or not that plays in, they, they were able to put 11 billion into reserves. They gave uh, all state workers a 5% raise. Um, they did quite a bit for FRS uh, uh, as well. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see, but, but hopefully we'll be able to celebrate when, when the budget is signed. Um, with that, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I normally go right into the bills that passed and how they impact you. I want to quickly talk, though, about the bills that didn't pass because we think that they're going to be coming back. And as Candace mentioned, we're going to be right back here. So just to make you aware of them, and then we'll quickly go through the bills that pass, and you guys can ask us questions um, as we go along. So the first one was sovereign immunity. Uh, there was a really big appetite to raise sovereign immunity caps this year. Um, the House proposed a really crazy number, 2.5 million and 5 million, up from 200,000 and 300,000. 
400,000. The Senate kept at 400,000, 600,000, where we feel like we fell because we had a lot of conversations with, with key House members and also the Senate President's office. We felt like everyone was going to agree to maybe a, a $100,000 increase at the end of the day. Everyone wanted an increase, but they were they were really looking at making sure that it really wasn't going to be a huge increase at the end of the day. Um, however, with a little bit of luck and, and some hard work in there, the bill actually stalled. Um, so we were happy about that. We do expect it to come back, however. Um, there was another bill, uh, and I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Starkey for her help with this, uh, with residential permitting. Um, it would have significantly reduced times uh, to review permits. Um, and we expect that bill to come back. Uh, we're going to be in contact with Representative Esposito, who was really the main driver behind that bill. She's over in the southwest uh, a corner of the state. Um, and, and Councilwoman Starkey gave us some, some really great data that we were able to use. Uh, so we want to we want to thank you for that. And also thank you to Leona for, for also helping facilitate uh, information that we needed for that. There was also a solid waste bill that would have made it to where you could not enter into exclusive agreements for solid waste. Um, and, and it was for commercial, but it would have impacted your residential and it would have impacted your franchise fees. Um, and we worked very, very closely with the League of Cities. We actually put together a working group with the League of Cities, the Florida Association of Counties and other waste companies that were opposed to the bill as well because they saw what the problems would be with that bill as well. Um, unfortunately, we expect that bill to come back as well. Uh, and then vacation rentals, um, which was basically my life for the whole end of session. Um, that bill fortunately died uh, the very last day of session. Um, but it was, it was a very difficult bill. Uh, it it, it kind of starts from a hybrid place of of a local registration process, uh, but also questionable state enforcement. It caps what you can require in the local registration process. It caps what you can charge uh, for that registration process, uh, inspection fees, and there are all different kinds of variations of the languages that were going back and forth, uh, both internally in the chambers and between the chambers. Um, we, we do expect that bill again to come back uh, in, in a similar version of where the Senate left off. Um, but we are going to continue to, to be in conversations. I've already sent an email to the Senate President's office to try to get a meeting uh, with her staff again just to kind of get in the conversation for, for next session. Uh, and, and hopefully we can have it in, a, in, a, in an actual posture that we can support instead of having to constantly fight it and constantly fight these, these kind of talking points that don't really give the full picture um, of, you know, they say it gives local governments more tools, but it doesn't. It preempts you entirely, so it doesn't really give more tools. Um, and we also want to thank the Broward delegation members for being so strong uh, with us for all of these preemption bills um, that we can always turn to them. The final one I want to mention is municipal utilities. Um, that This bill, it really stemmed out of an issue out of Gainesville, and they were able to pass a local bill. They did pass that local bill. Yeah, so I, I'm hoping it doesn't come back because they, they, I mean, it wasn't good for the city of Gainesville, but as long as it doesn't impact us, you know, um, uh, hopefully it doesn't come back because they passed a local bill dealing with the city of Gainesville. But with that, it would have moved all municipal utilities in, under the PSC um, to where you, you would not even be able to regulate them. Um, it was really a matter of legislators not understanding how enterprise funds work and how your utilities really work and how administration works. Um, and again, it was really targeted to one city, but they made it to where it, it applied to all. Um, so thankfully that bill uh, stalled in the Senate and, and hopefully it won't be back next year, but I wanna make sure that you're aware of it. Um, then moving on to the bills that passed, uh, the Senate President's number one priority, as all of you know, was SB 102. This was the Live Local Act, um, and this had to do with affordable housing. There were a lot of really great things in the bill. It put over $700 million into affordable housing programs, but there was also a super preemption in the bill having to do with land use and zoning, and that is basically if a, if a development comes in and they propose 40% or more of the development for affordable housing units under a 30-year agreement, they can go into a commercial or mixed-use zone and you have to grant the maximum density allowed within your jurisdiction and the maximum height allowed within one mile of the proposed development. And it must be administratively approved, so you can't have um, any public comment, any architectural review, or, or any of the public process that you're normally used to. We did try to mitigate this portion of it, um, but we were essentially told, listen, everybody wants a carve out from this, and, and they were very concerned with, with NIMBYism, um, and that was really Really the the target of that portion that that piece uh, they rushed it very much through the process it was out of the Senate floor uh, I think in week one 
Um, and it really didn't get any changes in the House side either. I don't know if we'll be able to see a glitch bill, um, but that provision stands for 10 years and then it sunsets after 10 years. But the goal was really to inject more units, affordable housing units into the market. Um, and, and that was what the intent was behind that portion of the bill. But just to be aware that that is out there and, and a lot of people are trying to figure out what does that mean for their communities and what is that really gonna look like for their communities. Um, the one good thing, although it's not really good, is that we do know property insurance is, is, is difficult right now, especially for um, habitational commercial properties. So that might actually still mitigate some of what could have been the impacts. But we'll, that remains to be seen. Another bill that the Senate president supported as a priority was SB 170. This bill uh, we saw last year, it was SB 280. You might re recall there were dueling proposals last year um, that we had to work through and, and um, uh, we, we spent a lot of time with Senator Hudson last year getting a compromise on these two bills. One of them that passed would have allowed businesses to sue local governments if you pass an ordinance that affected their profits. That bill was vetoed by the governor. The bill that didn't pass last year was then fast-tracked through the process this year. And that bill, it creates a rocket docket system to where if a, if a business comes forward and challenges one of your ordinances, and it doesn't apply to a lot of different ordinances, emergency ordinances, growth management, et cetera, we were able to carve a lot out. But if particular ordinances that kind of impact businesses and regulatory ordinances like that, if they challenge it, there's an automatic stay put on that ordinance. The court must then give priority to that challenge, so it's a, that rocket docket system. Um, and then there's a, a provision in place for, for the appeals process, what it means um, if you win. Uh, we did get prevailing party attorney's fees in there, um, so it wasn't just one-sided, but that portion is in there. Another part of that bill would require a, a business impact statement uh, for those same types of ordinances. Uh, and that, that business impact statement, fortunately, we, we got it kind of watered down to where you don't have to hire outside help to do it. It's just a good faith estimate of how many businesses would be impacted, what you think those impacts might be. And it's really for transparency purposes and education purposes so that the public is aware of what you're really looking at and what the impacts would be and, and, and so that you all are aware too before you vote on something, what those impacts to businesses might be. Uh, then moving on to the, the House Speaker's priorities, uh, one of his main priorities was a, a bill having to do with ESG, which is environmental social governance. And essentially this bill would make it to where if you, if you have an investment or you're looking at an investment and it, and it preempts investment decisions, procurement decisions, uh, and also financial institutions that you, that you bank with and work with. Um, and essentially they're saying that if it, that you cannot take into consideration any type of ideology, whether you want to make the environment better, climate change, um, uh, you know, just various, any type of thing that's driven by an ideology has to be driven by a pecuniary financial decision. So you can invest in green energy projects if you think it's going to make you money, but only if you can show that it's going to make you money. Like, hey, the trend is going this way, you know, this, this company is, is um, they have a lot of cash flow, et cetera. If you can show that type of thing, then you can still invest in it, but you can't invest in it just because you want to invest in green energy projects because of what it will do for emissions, et cetera. Uh, it, that also applies, again, to procurement decisions. So procurement decisions have to be based on the best deal for the town. They cannot be based on any type of social agenda or any, any type of deal like that. Um, I also want to mention Form 6. So all city commissioners and council members, town, town councils, uh, current elected officials will have to file a Form 6 instead of a Form 1, and that applies to all of you uh, July 1st, 2024, you'll have to file for 2023. So be keeping that in mind. Um, the Ethics Commission is very, very helpful. They actually sponsor an attorney of the day every single day. You can call their hotline and say, I want to speak to an attorney, and they will put an attorney on for you. And we're also working with the Ethics Commission, commission to try to uh, organize a a, a training potentially for some attorneys here in, in municipal attorneys here in Broward and we'll make sure that you you all have that information uh, whenever that takes place um, so maybe we can get everybody together and get everybody trained and that way you don't have to call up to the state you can also talk to your your town attorney as well um, and hopefully that will that will help with with um, implementation 
I also want to mention that there was an HOA Bill of Rights bill that was passed. Happy to answer any questions about that. The Land Use and Development Bill, unfortunately, we opposed that bill. That bill did pass, um, and that will lengthen the horizon that you have to plan in your comp plans uh, to 10 and 20 years. It also changes the type of data that you can use. Uh, they were saying that local governments were not updating their, their comp plans as frequently as they should, and so that's why that bill uh, was there. On the environmental side, some bills that passed were there was an environmental protection bill, and that actually expanded wastewater grants. Hopefully that's going to help get more money to areas that aren't in a BMAP. As you might recall, we've always had some trouble with like, wastewater grants and, and water projects because we're not within a BMAP. So this would expand eligibility. Um, so we're hopeful that that will, uh, you know, ar articulate in some more money for, for our areas here. Um, same thing with uh, sea level rise bill that passed. That also expanded resiliency grants as well for resiliency planning. And additionally with that bill, it also has certain state-funded public structures uh, right now, if you're building on the coast, you have to do a sea level rise projection before study before you can build. This expanded it to where it's not within the coast because of inland flooding. Uh, so that, that would be helpful for our area as well. Um, I also want to mention, too, there was a fertilizer preemption that was slipped into the budget implementing bill at the very last minute. I actually, I had some questions when uh, Representative Cassell and I were talking just a little bit earlier. I told Leona, I'm going to get some clarification on it because it might impact your, it, it may mean that your fertilizer ordinance cannot be enforced for a year. I'm going to clarify if that is the case or not, and we'll make sure that you guys get that answer. Um, and then with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I know there's a lot of bills that I didn't touch on, but there's a lot to go over. So I, and I feel like I've taken too much Certainly appreciate your time. Thank you. You're all doing a great job. We really appreciate it. And we're going to move on to the uh, consent agenda. Good luck. We appreciate it. Get some rest. Staff is requesting to table the following items to July 26, uh, 12 and 13. One's the right of way of easement agreement and construction easement agreement. May I have a motion to uh, table? So moved. Motion to table. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Um, the applicant is requesting to table variance number 21 to August 2nd. May I have a motion? So moved. Table oh, 21. And second, thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. On the consent agenda, I'm polling one, two, and three. Councilmember Whitman, do you have anything to poll? Anybody else have anything to poll? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus one, two, and three? Motion to approve consent agenda minus one, two, and three. And I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the first proclamation will be uh, read by Council Member Whitman on uh, Safety Awareness Month. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. We have Jose Lugo, and it looks like the HR department in full strength here. <laughs> Go ahead. Whereas the month of June is proclaimed as National Safety Month by the National Safety Council, and whereas the town of Davie values its employees and their families and has made a commitment to provide a safe work environment to educate employees through safety awareness programs and to encourage the use of safe practices at home, work, and in their local communities. And whereas workplace injuries continue to take place and the number of unintentional injuries incurred off the job continue to rise. And whereas on the job or off the job injuries affect employees' families. And whereas the <coughs> safety and health of employees are of utmost importance. And whereas the town of Davie has demonstrated leadership in educating its employees in the prevention of injuries in the workplace, on our roads and highways, and in our homes and communities, 
Now therefore it be proclaimed that the mayor and the town council of the town of Davy do hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as Safety Awareness Month throughout the town of Davy and encourage all employees to learn more about health and safety practices for home, work, and play and to take the necessary steps to reduce the risk of serious injury and death. Thank you very much. Good evening, your, Mayor. Your, your turn. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Could you uh, speak into the mic, please? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we right. can. Okay. Mayor, Council Members, thank you so much for having the opportunity to stand here and receive the safety proclamation for the Town of Davie. We recognize June as Safety Month, but after all here we work very hard 365 days a year on, um, on this initiative to bring uh, safety to the forefront. Um, I would like to recognize the team because this is a team effort. It starts with the town council, with their uh, support, with all the programs that we have and um, everything we ask for seems that we always get when we're looking for initiatives and programs and training. Thank you um, for the town administrator. Thank you. Well, recently I came forward with an opportunity for town employees to receive training, the active assailant training, and they were very supportive of that. We've had done two sessions so far in partnership with the Davy Police Department. It's been very well received. Um, we're going to continue to have more trainings with that. I'd um, like to recognize our staff, um, Grace Caragosa, HR Director. Again, very supportive of our programs and everything that we've brought forward. Um, she's a great leader. Um, Jessica Ginter, our risk technician. She's very supportive on the day to day with the crash review board, with the safety committee. And behind me is Chris Kittleson from Public Risk Underwriters, and he would also like to share some words. Thank you, Jose. Madam Mayor and Council Members, my name is Chris Kittleson, and I'm the safety consultant that has worked at the town of Davie, working on my 13th year. So I've had the pleasure of working with, with all of you. It's been very enjoyable. And I just wanted to say that the Risk Management Department does an outstanding job and everything in that safety proclamation is absolutely so true. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with an organization like this because what they're doing is not only helping to protect your employees, but also the residents and the people that do business in your town and visit your town, your lovely town. So with that, I'd certainly like to thank you for inviting me this evening to be a part of this celebration and recognition and proclamation. And also like to thank you for the opportunity to be your property and casualty insurer, preferred governmental trust. So thank you. Mayor, it's nice to put a face to a name with Jessica. What? It's nice to put a face to a name with Jessica because we get our emails yeah. but we've never seen seen you, so it's nice to put a face to a name. Thank Some of those face. recipes are very, very your good. Your work is excellent. <laughs> excellent work. All of you. Thank you. Jessica, thank you very much. Keep it up. Uh, thank take you. Take a picture. We're going to move on to um, number three, which is the Boys and Girls Club. Is the program manager Ronald here? He's yeah, I saw it. I saw you. Uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, Mrs. Starkey will read the proclamation. Thank you. Whereas the young people of Davie are tomorrow's leaders, and whereas many young people need professional youth services to help them reach their full potential as productive, caring, and responsible citizens, and whereas Rick and Rita Case and the Florence de George Boys and Girls Clubs in Davie provide services to more than 2,600 young people ages 6 to 18 annually, and whereas the Boys and Girls Clubs are placed where great futures start, they are at the forefront of the efforts in teen programming, academics, character development, and healthy lifestyles. And whereas the Boys and Girls Club organizations in our community help ensure that our young people keep off the streets, offer them, offering them a safe and supportive place to go, and providing them with quality programs. Whereas the Boys and Girls Clubs of Broward County will be celebrating National Boys and Girls Club Week from June 25th to July 1st, 2023, along with some 4,000 clubs and more than 2 million young people nationwide. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Mayor and Town Council of the Town of Davie do hereby proclaim the week of June 25th through July 1st, 
2023 as Boys and Girls Club Week and all of the citizens to join in us in recognizing and commending the Boys and Girls Club organizations in our community and providing comprehensive, effective services to the young people in our community signed by our mayor. Thank you. Should I just say a few words? Uh, yes. <clears throat> thank you, guys. Uh, um, my name is Ron. Um, I would like to thank the town of Davie for everything they do for our kids. Uh, we started our summer program, so if you have any kids, uh, we serve kids 6 through 18. So if you have any kids here for the summer, we'll welcome, uh, we'll, we're welcome for you guys to bring them over. So thank you so much, and we'd like to say thank you. Thank you. We've got to get your picture taken. And number two, National Caribbean American Heritage Month. The gentleman who is going to accept that is not here, so I would like to invite any one of our staff or members of the audience who are of Caribbean heritage to come forward. If we have anyone here, come on. I know there's a few of you <laughs> out on, there. Come on. <laughs> come on, Mons. Come, come on, Mons. Come on, I know we come have on. people. May, may if I can, in, I want to invite Leona. Yeah. Adam. Our, um, isn't um, our engineer? Renuka. Our engineer. No. Bill Archer. Oh. Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> now they're being Come on, Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Did I ask for a motion on this? Yes. I'm sorry. Huh? A motion for uh, did we, National Caribbean. No, we didn't. a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. That's unanimous. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor will read the proclamation. <clears throat> Whereas America's diversity is and has always been the defining strength of our nation. In every generation, our society, spirit, and shared ambitions have been refreshed by wave after wave of immigrants seeking out their American dream. And whereas throughout our history, Caribbean Americans have brought vibrant cultural languages, traditions, and values to strengthen our country and add new chapters to our common story. And whereas Caribbean Americans have made our country more innovative, more prosperous, they have enriched our nation's arts and culture, our public institutions, and our economy. And whereas despite the powerful legacy of achievement of Caribbean Americans and many members of the Caribbean American community continue to face systemic barriers <coughs> to equity, opportunity, and justice. Whereas during the National Caribbean American Heritage Month, we celebrate the legacy and essential contributions of Caribbean Americans who have added so much to our American fabric. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Mayor and Town Council of Town of Davie do hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as National Caribbean American Heritage Month and encourage all Americans to join in celebrating the history, culture, and achievements of, American, of Caribbean Americans. <clears throat> Signed by Mayor Judy Paul. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much for filling in at the last minute. We appreciate it. Now you're going to get your picture taken. Wait, and, and you have to bring Caribbean food in tomorrow. That's the gig. <laughs> okay, that... Um, we're going to open the public hearing portion of the meeting. And we'll start with uh, number 14, which is a resolution, the CDBG Action Plan. Who's going to be reading the uh, resolution by title? Is that going to be Alan? Okay. Do you want me to start? Yeah. You're on, Alan. A resolution of the town of Davie, Florida. Adopting the Community Development Block Grant CDBG Action Plan for fiscal year 2023 through 2024, which includes the Community Development Block Grant CDBG program budget, authorizing the town administrator to execute all necessary certifications and grant related documents, providing for conflict, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone that wishes to speak for or against this item? You can come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Are there any uh, points of discussion by council? Again, we want to thank 
the hard work that goes into uh, things like this and uh, our staff that works very diligently on it. We appreciate it. Could I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Councilmember Hatton? Yes. Councilmember Starkey? Yes. Mayor Paul? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And we'll go to a few of the uh, second and final readings. Uh, number 15 is the code is a code amendment. Mr. Weinfeld, would you read the ordinance by title, please? Yes, Mayor. In order for the town of Davie, Florida, amending the following sections of Chapter 12, Land Development Code. Article 9, Rural Lifestyle Regulations, Division 1, generally. Division 2, Scenic Corridors, Overlay District. Division 3, Rural Lifestyle Development Regulations. Division 4, Site Design Regulations. And Division 5, Open Space Design Overlay. Provide for conflict, provide for severability, and provide for an effective day. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Anyone that wishes to speak for or against this item can come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any questions or concerns? Okay. May I have a motion to approve code amendment? Motion to approve 15 code amendment. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, Roll call, please. Councilmember Starkey? Yes. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Mayor Paul? Yes. Councilmember Hatton? Yes. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Number 16 is the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Second reading. Mr. Weinfeld, will you read the ordinance by title? Yes, Mayor. In order of the Town of Davie, Florida, amending policy 13.1-3, in the plan implementation section of the future land use element of the Town of Davie Comprehensive Plan. Provide for conflict, provide for severability, and provide for an effective day. Thank you very much. This is an open public hearing. Anyone wish to speak for or against this item? Come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Motion to approve comprehensive plan amendment. Is there a second? Second. All the uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hatton? Yes. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Mayor Paul? Yes. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Starkey? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Number 17 is also a code amendment. Mr. Weinfeld, would you read the ordinance by title? This is the second reading. Yes, Mayor. In ordinance of the Town of Davie, Florida, amending Chapter 6, Article 1, Section 9.1 of the Town of Davie Code of Ordinances titled Mitigation of Code Enforcement Leads. Provide for conflict, provide for severability, and provide for an effective date. Thank you very much. This is open public hearing. Anyone that wishes to speak for or against this item may come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any questions or discussion from Council? Okay. May I have a motion to approve code amendment number 17? Motion to approve code amendment number 17. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Mayor Paul? Yes. Councilmember Starkey? Yes. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Councilmember Hatton? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Number 18, this uh, is a first reading. But the second reading will be on July 26th. Um, this code amendment, Mr. Weinfeld, would you read the ordinance by title? Yes, Mayor. In order to the town of Davie, Florida, creating Chapter 16, Article 8, Section 16-137, Definition, and amending Chapter 7, Article 5, Section 7-71, Definition. Provide for severability, provide for conflict, and provide for an effective date. Thank you very much. This is an open public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak on this item may come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any questions from anybody up here? Uh, may I have a motion to approve Code Amendment 18? Motion to approve Code Amendment 18. Second. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. 
Council Member Starkey? Yes. Council Member Hatton? Yes. Mayor Paul? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Number 19 is also a code amendment. Mr. Weinthal, would you read the ordinance by title? Yes, Mayor. In ordinance for the town of Davie, Florida, amending the following sections of Chapter 12, Land Development Code, Section 12-33, General Regulations. Section 12-34, Standards for Specific Uses. Section 12-208, Requirements for Off-Street Parking. Section 12-503, Definitions. Section 12-541 in general, and Section 12-548, flood resistant development, providing for severability, providing for conflict, and providing for an effective date. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishes to speak and come forward at this time? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Is there any comment or questions? Mm -hmm. from, no, seeing none. Um, close, we close the public hearing. Um, May I have a motion to approve number 19 code amendment? Motion to approve number 19 code amendment. I'll second that amendment. May I have a roll call, Madam Clerk? Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Council Member Hatton? Yes. Council Member Starkey? Mayor Paul? Yes. Council Member Whitman? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Quasi judicial, number 20 is a variance. Was it um, tabled? This is uh, Mr. Weinthal has the uh, quasi been waived. Okay, thank you. Would you please read the uh, variance by title? Yes, Mayor. A resolution of the Town of Davie, Florida, taking final action on variance application D23-009, 9232 Arbor Wood Circle. Provide for conflict, provide for severability, and provide for an effective date. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this can come forward at this time. Is the applicant here? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Would you like to make a statement? Your, state your name and address, please. Certainly. Gerard Starkey, 9232 Arborwood Circle, Davie, Florida. First off, I'd like to thank the staff for their consideration of working through this application process for the entire time. They've been great to deal with. Uh, I'm asking that it's really not even a deck. It's actually four and a half inches off the ground. I'm replacing an existing deck that the previous owner had put up, uh, come to find out without permitting. So the HOA said that if I get a variance from the town, they would allow the deck to be replaced. So I'm asking the council to consider this request. Mr. Quigley, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, th there's a there's a, uh, a letter from the HOA or a correspondence from the HOA with their with their decision. Uh, staff's gone through the usual uh, analysis, and we provided a, um, a a graphic that shows better the. Uh, the town setback requirements in green versus what's actually built on, on the survey. It's an unusual development because it's uh, zero uh, setback on one, one side and then 10 feet on the other side. Other than that, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, Anybody have any comments? Mm -hmm. I know um, I'm just, I have to stay consistent. Um, you know that I've had a history of, with uh, variances and that um, there has to be a hardship. And uh, I, don't, I don't see the hardship here other than it's already been built after the fact, yes? I had some comments when you get it. Huh? When you're through, I have some comments. Yeah, okay. I've been calling you. Okay. Uh, from what I understand, and, and I don't see it in, in my backup, uh, the neighbors have okayed this. I'm, I'm asking Mr. Starkey, and I'm asking, I guess, our staff. Well, the st staff can answer it. Yes, the, the staff report includes a map showing the property owners that provided letters of no objection. And this is a deck, correct? Just, just, I'm reading this right. This it's is just a deck. Ground. 
it, it's it's really two things. It's partially a um, uh, concrete pavers, and then the the raised deck is is also in the in the setback area. Why why does this need a variance? Because it's, the it's not a building. Because he built it without a permit. He didn't. The previous it, owner did. In the in the zoning districts, the um, there's a, a minimum yard required for for most residential uh, zoning districts. And the minimum yard, we, we all call it a setback. It's the part of the yard that has to be, you know, grass and trees and not, and not structures. There's some exceptions to that, like uh, air conditioners, equipment, and things like that could be within five feet. But in this case, it's 10 feet on one side and five feet on, on the rear. And those, those setbacks aren't provided. They've just been filled in with structures. Is it okay with engineering as far as flooding? Engineering did not raise an issue about about it impeding flooding. It's really more of a quality of life issue, you know. And every, every different zoning district that we have tries to create a certain style about the, the amount of setbacks that they have and the heights and those kinds of things. And it's really a, it boils down to a quality of life issue. It's not a matter of uh, a public safety issue or anything like that. But it's. It's a matter of uh, quality of life. It seems to me the only quality of life it would affect would be Mr. Starkey. It, it's it's yeah. nobody seeing it. It's just a deck. Were you the Were you the original builder, or was that there before when you moved in? Uh, no, council member, I was not. It was there. I'm sorry. It, it was there when I moved. Okay, in. I couldn't hear you. It, it would, I'm sorry. It was in disrepair. It's a very small parcel, so the deck allows a better usage of the property. A lot of other owners that have put in cement. Where I chose to put in wood, I thought was more in keeping with the town's natural environment. And, and if, if I can Michelle, address the letter, yeah. are there any trees? No. Are there any trees that are on the? I, I'm looking at it as I guess the. Is this the north side? Are there any trees? She's asking. There, there are community trees outside of the property. That's outside the property. She's talking about inside, I think. No, yes. the, the parcel is way too small for any trees. There's landscaping there that's been put in. Okay. Numerous pots and plants. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second it. Roll call. Vice Mayor Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Whitman? Yes. Councilmember Hatton? Yes. Councilmember Starkey? Mayor Paul? No. Motion passes. That concludes the um, yeah. open public hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, I'm just going to skip past the appointments. Um, old, old business, no new business. Um, number 24, Ms. Lamack, are you handling this, the transition to a four-day week? I'm very excited about this. I think it's a great idea. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard Lamack, Town Administrator. Mayor, Council Members, Members of the Public. This presentation is regarding a new four-day work week schedule, and I'm presenting it prior to implementation. This is an advanced opportunity to inform the community about upcoming changes and customer, services benefit, customer service benefits to our community. The Town has been studying the work week schedule to identify opportunities to enhance customer service while increasing employee morale, retention, and recruitment. It has been determined by the town that this would, we would benefit from a, from a work week transition from five days to four days, a transition that many government agencies and businesses have undertaken with positive feedback. As such, the town is modifying operational hours to extend services via a four day, 10 hour work uh, per day work week. The four day work week will begin on August 3rd 
2023 in the new schedule for town hall and other administrative offices is Monday through Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. This advance notice to residents, business owners, and employees allows for any needed adjustments to the new work week schedule and extended hours of operational service. Our staff will be on site earlier and will leave later. This will ensure that we meet the needs of our community. A recurring comment from our residents is that they had wished that we had opened our doors earlier or, late, or stayed later to meet services to accommodate their work schedule needs. Others have indicated, interestingly, that they are using online services more than ever and remain unaffected by the work week hour or hours change. I want to be sure that everyone knows there will be no impacts on the services provided by our public safety personnel, including police, fire responses, public safety dispatch, or utility plant operations. And as mentioned, we will continue in those areas the 24-7-365 coverage. So which departments are included in the change? The departments included in this change are the town hall, where we're at right now, at the Pine Island Park, including building, engineering, town clerk, utilities, customer service, parks, recreation, cultural arts, and administrative offices. The community services division, which is located at 4700 Southwest 64th Avenue, also, the Davy uh, Fire Rescue Public Works Lobby at 6901 Orange Drive. The Davy Police Lobby at 1230 South Knob Hill Road. And Utilities Department Administration, uh, Administrative and Customer Services Offices. As mentioned, I just want to say it again, is that police, fire, utility, plant operations continue to operate uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. There are some exceptions um, to this four-day work week. As we have year-round recreational opportunities, programs, and amenities, the Pine Island Multipurpose Center, which is a main hub for our indoor programming and recreational activities and rental opportunities, will continue with its regular, op regular operations. They will open Monday through Friday, 8 to 9.30 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The Pine Island Fitness and Aquatic Center will continue operating Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The pool area will operate Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 8 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. There will be no changes to the hours of operation for the town's park and recreational amenities. Town parks, playgrounds, and restrooms will continue nor normal operations from 9 a.m. to sunset, except for Driftwood, Shenandoah, Waterford, and Waverly Parks that close at 9 p.m., and Pine Island, Multi, uh, Pine Island Park, Banford Sports Complex that closes at um, 10 p.m. To ensure that the community is informed and prepared in advance of the upcoming changes, we have several ways in which we'll share this information. We're kicking off our first launch of this information today through discussions. Later this week, we'll disseminate a press release that includes frequently asked questions about the four-day work week. We'll be sharing this on the town's social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. We're going to dedicate a page and a banner on the town's website. We'll share this on our um, on, uh, Davy Update magazine and weekly newsletters. Informational signs will be displayed around town. The use of bus benches will be implied. We'll share the information with the Davy Cooper City Chamber of Commerce, use flyers, posters, and we'll also have it on our on-hold messaging system. And although we've had extensive communication with our employees, I'm going to ask the town clerk to distribute a letter to you all that you have. This letter will be sent and distributed to all our employees to let them know exactly what's included in tonight's presentation and they'll be getting this letter um, tomorrow. With that, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to address those for you. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor. Yeah, I may have missed it, but in your early part of the presentation, but um, so we have all the support from our unions and um, 
from what I understood when we spoke. Is that correct? Yes. They're supportive of this, so it doesn't have any I problems want, with our... Well, I just want to make it clear, we do have this support and we do have exceptional relationships. It's not something that they um, have control over, but we don't do that anyway. But yeah. we have worked cooperatively with them and they are supportive of it, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I know we've been talking about it for a long time. I know. We, we suggested this years ago. and uh, it's, I think it's... You know, you're, you're here anyway. It saves money for gas. Yep. It saves travel time. Uh, and then people will have enough time to make arrangements if they need to for, for child care and things like that, I think. so. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, number 25. Are we going to um, have any discussion on this, or is it just for me to announce that uh, the workshop to discuss the Pine Island Road widening project, the sound walls, has been set for August 3rd at 6 p.m.? We had an ethics training that day, so to eliminate a gap and having to hang around for a couple of hours, uh, we requ I requested that we move the ethics training from 3 to 5 and then we'll be served a bite to eat, and then we'll go into the workshop at 6. Thank you. Um, and now we know that we're not going to meet again until July, July 26th. Um, on uh, Mayor and Council Member comments, uh, Council Member Whitman, would you like to start? Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank our Parks and Recreation team for doing such a marvelous job with the Memorial Day Parade and Ceremony. As always, everything went off with a hitch. Betty Booth Pool is officially open. Bring your swimsuits. It is important to see this amenity reopened as it is so easily accessible to all in the community. Sometimes you don't realize how much people care for you until you are going through some tough moments. Recently, I suffered the loss of a dear family member, and I had so many people reaching out to send well wishes. I want to thank everyone for contacting me to ensure that my family and I were okay and doing well. Finally, I would like to wish all of the June babies a happy birthday and enjoy all your celebrations. Be safe and have a happy summer. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Just have a few quick uh, comments I'd like to make here. I want to uh, <clears throat> remind everyone that the final gardening workshop will take place on June 24th, which is a Saturday, at Robbins Lodge starting at 9 a.m. And uh, you'll get to learn a lot about uh, growing okra and, and uh, different things. I see quite a bit of people coming out on those. Yeah, they've been well attended. Yeah, it's been very well attended. Very, I, very I, popular. I, I, I've been go out there with my dog there on the weekend and I see everybody out there and it's been very, very, very good. I'm, I'm impressed. I also want to remind everyone next Friday, June 16th, is the next Sounds of the Town concert. It'll be right here at Pine Island Park starting at 6 p.m. I'm looking forward to that. Hope it doesn't rain. Yeah. 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 Oh, your lips are God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> this is our final meeting before July 4th festivities and it's a great event i hope to see everyone out there on july 4th the best to everyone thank you and congratulations to all those young high schoolers that have, i'm seeing everywhere i go now that are that have graduated here this year <laughs> congrats councilman starkey yes thank you mayor a couple of things just real quick um i had the honor of going to the mayor's breakfast on your behalf um, I know they attend this uh, pretty regularly. Every year they have it at least once or twice a year with the Realtor Association. And um, there were nine of us that were represented as guest speakers and panel on the panelists. And I want to tell you almost, what, 250, 300 people at the Broward Performing Arts Center that attended from Broward, Palm Beach, and St. Lucie Realtors Association. So it was well attended and it became quite fun actually with everybody you know cutting jokes and laughing and at the same time um, I think they walked away at least by many of the people who I've spoken to on the way out 
they um, really learned a lot from the different cities and what how what makes our cities unique. And I, I would have been remiss if I didn't tell them about our constant fight for home rule. And I told them how it's constantly being eroded by the legislators every year and that they're taking away our ability to be unique within our own cities. And I thought that was important to mention and making sure that they understood. I also mentioned, and it was always a touchy subject before, vacation rentals because some of the Realtor Association had supported the vacation rental units. And I went in to describe why it's good in some places and not always in all places. And then I've been working with um, <coughs> Commissioner Ortiz from Orlando who has areas that his community would like to have vacation rentals and but would like to be able to have the option of putting them there as well as those areas that they don't feel it's appropriate, whether they be because of a homeowners association or whether they are not suited for the community itself. So I worked with them. I told them that, you know, the, the town of Davie is always there for them. If they have any questions, we worked with them on the sign ordinance years ago, as well as working with them on many other issues. So anytime they have any questions, I told them to reach out to any of us on the town council and our mayor. And so it was well received. The League of Cities meet, is meeting, as you saw, we also discussed a lot of different things about um, solid waste. But they're also looking at um, the impact fee study. Uh, for the student generation ratios of our s developments. So I wanted to give this to, I don't know if the uh, planning and zoning director and everybody has had an opportunity to see this or participate in this, but I think it's important for everybody to know um, that they're proposing changes to the student generation ratio once again. Um, I, of course, believe it's a long time coming because the amount that they calculate uh, and the formula that they use to generate a number that would talk about how many s students would be representative in any particular home or home size is far off. It doesn't even build a couple of classrooms um, in a major development. So I've been trying to change this for a good 30 years, and I'm glad to see they're finally moving this one along to try to change it. So I brought copies um, if anybody's interested in seeing that. Um, Apart from that, I am going to be brief. I can't wait for summer. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a downtime, just like everybody else is, I'm sure. We're done. Glad we got that first budget hearing out of the way. And I can't thank staff enough for everything that you've done. Um, it's an amazing job of what you all do to get this to put before us for consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hyde. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few things tonight. Uh, first, uh, Parks and Rec Memorial Day was, was wonderful, as usual, excellent, thank you. Uh, the mystery dinner that was here the other day was really fun, it was great. Um, graduation season, as Councilmember said, uh, Lewis said, um, Councilmember Whitman and myself have been attending a few graduations, and um, the last one we went to was Western, and I, I want to congratulate Chief Kinsey and um, Mr. Fernandez Lorea, whose son graduated and Chief's daughter graduated. I don't know if there's any other parents in here who had children graduate this year, but congratulations. Anybody else have Grace. students graduating today? Yeah. Oh, Grace had one. Okay, and Grace, so I wanted to say that too. That's great. Another one might, you know, be on the way. They're on the way. So it was great. It was really wonderful. Um, one was at the Hard Rock and one was at the Brow Theater Performing Arts. Um, the Harvest Drive. Many of you know of the Harvest Drive. It's at Western High School. It's 30 years old. I think we went to their anniversary this year. Um, and when you go there, it's amazing. They have um, grocery bags in the gym and, and just covered. And they fill them and they send them out. Well, they're moving. They're, they need more space. so they're Just the boutique is moving. I, I thought they said the food, too. The okay. food, too? Okay. I, I, I could be wrong. But boot, they have a boutique there. And it's moving. It's gotten a larger. And they need... Children's seen clothing, men's clothing, shoes, linens, household items, anything that you, that's in good shape and, and can be gently used in working order can be used uh, for uh, children helping children. So if anybody needs information on how to contact them. Do they have an address there for where they moved to? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, donations can be brought to the new Harvest Drive Boutique location on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. at 4021 Southwest 47th Avenue in Davie. 
Bays two and three on the east side of the A plus storage building. I believe that's about 441. Right. If I'm correct. So, um, and I just have one last little thing. Happy birthday, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Happy thank you. Happy birthday to all of you. Yeah. Marlon and, and, oh, you, Marlon's June, June too. Yes. June 11th. June 11th. Oh, well, happy birthday, Marlon. Thank you. thank you. And anybody else besides Mayor? Are you always covered, so I just covered. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, I have a few things I want to look at. The first one is I think there's a loophole that we need to close and that has to do with design variations on developments where the uh, developer can get incentives and do things that uh, don't necessarily have to be, I, as I understand it, we don't have to vote on it, we can say that we don't approve of them, but the variations are included in the site plan, right? So we would have to deny the site plan in order to deny all the variations, because you can't take them one at a time, right? Is that correct? You can certainly discuss them one at a time as part you, of the, I can't hear you. You can, the council can certainly discuss them one at a time as part of the site plan, but yes, they are, they are kind of rolled into the yeah. site plan. Well, you know, I see it as a loophole where the, the developers are getting a lot more than we might hope for them to have in a project. And um, I'd be willing to meet with you and, and discuss this with you. Uh, we have something coming up on a, a, an agenda that has something like, what, 10 variations, and some of them I find very egregious. So we, we need to, I know we can't do anything about it this time, um, except when we're discussing it, to look at it clear. What? Could you give us an example? I'm, I'm trying to follow what you're saying. All right, and this, can I talk about something that's on an agenda in the future? This as long as it's just a public hearing, right? All right, there's something coming up. It's going to P and Z next week. Um, and an incentive is if you put trees in, you get an extra story. Oh, okay. Thank so you. in the in the area, it's only you can only have three stories. Thank but you. because of this variation, if you add trees, you can get a fourth story. I didn't understand. So that's, what I that's just one of them, and so that's the one one that bothers me the most. So. Yeah, so because we have designed variations a lot of times on on different projects, so um, that we need to take a look at. Like I say, we have to deal with that when it comes up, but uh, we we need to take a look at this and see if we can tighten that up a little bit. The other thing is, and we had a perfect example today, after the fact permits and variances, we've got to do more to um, discourage this type of activity. People do things, they know they need permits, they do it anyway, and then they ask for forgiveness and, and we give it to them. How are we ever gonna stop this practice unless we buckle down? And that's why you know a variance has to show a, a hardship. And if it doesn't show a hardship, we should be consistent in, in, in denying them. Uh, we went ahead and denied that one fence that one time, and I thought, oh, good, we're making progress. But um, obviously, we're not. Um, so we need to take a look, too, on how we can handle this. Um, I, I, I just can't handle after-the-fact permits without some sort of a violation charge or something like that. There is a charge. Well, there's a charge for the variance when they come in for the variance. So, but whatever. Uh, it, but it obviously it's not strong enough because it doesn't discourage the individuals. But I, I'd like to take a look at that too. We've had a number of people uh, that have contacted me about opening the lake, Wolf Lake. Um, we've had some discussion about that. It seems the only people that are coming to me are people that have summer camps and want to use the lake to take their kids swimming as part of their camp program for which they get paid a fee. So, you know, 
I haven't heard it from any other private citizens. I've only heard it so far from those individuals that have summer camps. Um, in discussing this uh, with Mr. Pullman and Mr. Lamack, it's been determined that um, the, the numbers on the lake are still too high. It can't, because of the stagnant nature of the lake, they can't put in an aeration system because it will stir up the bottom and create more havoc. They can't pipe anything to the canal because the numbers in the canal, which they tested, are just as high as the lake. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, so uh, we need to draft um, uh, a statement uh, to let those summer camps know uh, that the dangers involved and the biggest thing is the liability. They say to me, well, let us take the chance. We'll take our horses in and then we'll go, we'll, we'll hose them off and bathe them afterwards. What about the children? The day that uh, the individual contacted me about uh, her horse getting a terrible rash, she said there were people with little kids, infants with life jackets on, sitting in the lake. You know, if they have a, a cut or something and they get a bacterial infection, uh, the, the liability for the town is unsurmountable. So, you know, as much as I love my horses and I love to let people ride and, and swim in the lake, we cannot approve anything that is going to be detrimental to anyone in the public. So uh, we're going to move forward with some sort of a, a statement as far as that's concerned. Um, and the last thing, July 4th is coming up, and I know I have been accused of being unpatriotic and uh, un-American because of my feelings about fireworks. Certainly with my love for our veterans and everything that we do for our armed forces, that is certainly not the case. Um, but I just have to say again, July 4th is coming up, the fireworks are coming up, we say you shouldn't have fireworks when a thousand feet of livestock. We have so many horses over here on 92nd Avenue, and I just I feel that it's a little hypocritical that we continue uh, with the fireworks. And uh, some of the people move their horses; others have to tranquilize them. But um, you know, we should still be mindful of the fact that we are a horse community. We're a community with a lot of veterans uh, that suffer uh, from loud noises. I mean, we even had an incident with a veteran that lived near the rodeo arena when they were doing practice there with the police, and, and he was so traumatized by the gunfire. It was, it was quite, quite a concern. So, you know, people don't realize uh, what the, tra the traumatic uh, part of the fireworks is and uh, you want to sit and if we lived on the beach it would be something else you put a barge out on the ocean and and you watch the thing but um i was thinking where did we have a body of water we could do it and i was thinking veterans park but then we have no place to park so vista view isn't huh vista view isn't there. well we tried something at vista view already and they, you can't have fireworks there, but you can sit and watch all the fireworks, but you can't hear the explosions, and that's what the people didn't like. So that made us unpatriotic. So anyway, okay, I vented. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lamack. Thank you, Mayor. If I'm, I'm going to ask for a little leeway, I have a few things that I need to do tonight. because you what? little leeway in my time tonight. Be oh, okay. Because uh, we're not going to meet again for several weeks and there's things I want to share with you. Uh, the first thing I just want to tell you, in March of 2023, uh, the town of Davie submitted a grant agreement through the Florida Local Government Cyber Security Grants Program. The program was launched to encourage local governments to build new digital infrastructure and maintain existing infrastructure to keep government data safe and secure. Last month, the town received notification that our IT department's project was selected for the grant funding, a first for the team. The town was awarded funding for a security operations platform, which will assist expanding security tool sets and monitoring services, as well as improving capabilities to respond to cybersecurity incidents and ensure continuity of operations. The grant equates to $250,000 
with a 10% match to be provided by the town. The town share will not impact our operating budget since the total cost for the software has already been budgeted in the FY24 IT budget. Cybersecurity, as you know, is crucial for local governments. This, these funds will allow the town to continue to expand the security investment that we've had made to date. Once agreements finalized between the town and the state in the coming months, the grant agreement will be coming forward for your review and approval. And I want to acknowledge Victoria Dominguez, that's our grant coordinator for this initiative, working along with our IT department. So it was a great job, and I, and I thank them all. The next thing I'd like to do is uh, I have two short videos that I want to share with you. The first one um, is they're both, by the way, promotional and a marketing uh, and recruitment videos. The first is a police recruitment video, and I'm going to ask just Chief Kinsey if he'll come up just for a minute and introduce the video. Chief. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Town Council, Administration staff, Steve Kinsey, Chief of Police. Uh, I know you've heard me talk about recruiting probably endlessly and the challenge of us trying to recruit the best of the best men and women to the Davie Police Department. So in the summer of 2022, we entered into a partnership with Nova Southeastern to develop the first ever Davie PD recruiting video. Uh, they were a great partner for us under the leadership of Dr. Grace Telesco, if you know her. And uh, we collaborated with them to do the filming and the planning and the editing. So fast forward to here, after months and months of planning and filming and editing, uh, we have a finished product that I want to show to you tonight. Uh, one of the things we did differently is most police recruiting videos are just about the police department, and it's the SWAT team breaking down the door and the motorcycles riding around. What we wanted to do was highlight the town of Davie and show people that if you come work for the Davie Police Department, you get immersed in the Davie culture, you get to live, work, and play in Davie to make our recruiting video stand out. So if I can borrow three minutes and 24 seconds of your time, I'll have Suzette uh, play the video for us. The town of Davie is a sprawling suburb located in the heart of Broward County with a population of 108,000 residents. Davie is different and unique from all other municipalities in South Florida, encompassing 37 miles of lush green open space with numerous parks, horse trails, businesses, colleges, and universities, beautiful residential areas, entertainment venues, and a short drive to the beach. Come to our South Florida paradise and join the men and women of the Davie Police Department. Our officers are invested in our town so that their families have a great place to live. The patrol division is the backbone of the agency. You'll start your career here and you'll be the first to respond to a call for help. While on patrol, you'll meet residents, business owners, and visitors to our town. Working for a police department is challenging. You will quickly learn that our residents value us. Depend on us and we're there when they need us. The Davy Police Department has 300 members comprised of sworn personnel and professional administrative staff. You'll find the specialty units you're looking for, including the mounted unit, dive team, motor unit, criminal investigations, SRT, community policing, and more. What was once a quiet farm town is now a unique, thriving, growing community. We're ideally located near the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport and Port Everglades. You can easily catch a flight or cruise of your choice or attend a local sports game with the many national professional South Florida sports teams in Davies backyard. Also, don't forget about our great weather year round. The Davy Police Department offers you a lifelong career to success. You have the training, technology, and equipment for modern day policing. Our training prepares us for any scenario. It could be a resident call for service up to a critical incident response. So why choose Davy Police Department for your law enforcement career? Did you know you can retire after 20 years of service? Did you know you're going to take home car? Did you know that you will receive a $5,000 state of Florida incentive pay for becoming a police officer and an additional 
$2,500 sign-on bonus in the town of Davie. These are just a few of the many reasons to join Davie Police Department. If you have the heart, determination, and commitment to help others, make the decision to be a public servant and choose Davie PD. Contact us and we'll help you take the next step to make the Davie Police Department your home. Davie is the town where you can live, work, and play. Come join the Davie Police Department and be part of something great. I'm just going to add, there's no actors used in that filming of that production, so. But thank you very much for your time. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, one other video. I'm going to get queued up here. This next video that we use for marketing, obviously promotion and recruitment, I think you're going to find also quite, quite uh, wonderful. This was produced by the Garing Group, also known as Bentec Health. In preparation for their annual conference, they had selected Davey to showcase our culture in video format. The video has been given to the town and we'll be using it, as I said, for marketing, recruitment, and new hire orientation. So I want to share this with you. Mayor, as you'll recall, there's other segments of this interview, and you, you and Troy Weekly were phenomenal in doing that, and this was played to, for, to all their clients throughout Florida, and, and it was very special, and I just wanted to share that all with you. With, with that being said, um, thank you. Have, I, I'd like to say have a nice summer. We'll catch you in July, into July, but we'll, we know we talk daily, so thanks for your commitment, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Weinthal? Yes, Mayor. Um, just wanted to remind everyone I am available. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Good. Yes. I just want to remind everyone I am available via cell phone if you need me. What did he say? He's available by phone if oh, anybody oh. needs him. So you have nothing to add? No. Thank you. If there are no objections, we're adjourned. What? She asked me to pass that to you.